The outstanding presentations during this conference clearly demonstrate that alarmist climate science and scenarios are devoid of actual honest science and evidence. They're removed from the scientific method, and yet they are being used to devise and justify and impose policies, laws, and regulations that will govern our lives. Rules formulated on the basis of dangerous man-made climate change allegations are designed to control the hydrocarbons that power America and the world, improve and safeguard our lives, lift billions out of abject poverty, and allow us to achieve technologies and dreams never before thought possible. Perhaps put simply, those who control carbon control our lives, our livelihoods, liberties, living standards, and even our lifespans. It is therefore essential that climate science reflects the utmost in integrity, transparency, and accountability. Sadly, the opposite is true. As we've seen, far too much of the supposed science used to justify IPCC, US, and UN, and other actions is unethically distorted, exaggerated, and even fabricated. If it were used to market private sector proposals, investments, products, or services, the perpetrators would be prosecuted for fraud. The latest White House claims are no better. The assertion that shutting down affordable, reliable, coal-based electricity will somehow reduce asthma rates and children diseases is as baseless as claims that we face an imminent man-made climate change disaster. A primary reason for the fervor and longevity of these claims, then, is that global warming is a social movement. Or more accurately, it is one manifestation of a social movement. It's a major part of a near religious deep ecology movement that is anti energy, anti people, and opposed to modern economies, technologies, and civilizations in its determination to impose its worldview on the rest of, of humanity, it is dogmatic, imperialistic, and authoritarian. It's also a big green and big government movement with tens of billions of dollars at its disposal every year. Over $13 billion per year just in the United States, just for big green groups, and that's their overall funding for those organizations in the USA. Global warming, climate change, climate disruption, Extreme weather are also almost interchangeable with sustainable development as a concept and mantra. When ClimateGate fizzled confabs in Copenhagen and Durban, and a then 15-year pause in Earth's warming made the wor world weary of climate change demagoguery, Real Plus 20 summit organizers simply repackaged climate crisis under the sustainability mantra. Fossil fuels, they intoned, must be replaced because we're running out of them. Their use is unsustainable. Like climate change, sustainability is infinitely elastic and malleable, making it a perfect weapon for anti-development activists. Whatever they support is sustainable. Whatever they disdain is unsustainable. For other times and audiences, climate and sustainability are replaced in whole or in part with overpopulation, resource depletion, the precautionary principle, and global species extinction or with con chemical contamination, which is why the topic is now shifting to carbon pollution and asthma. Think of the T-1000 android in the movie Terminator 2, Judgment Day. This vastly improved villain had the ability to morph into any shape it desired, giving it previously unimaginable powers and near indestructibility to serve the ultimate goal of controlling the future of humanity. And so we have Alexander King, co-founder of the Club of Rome and its concept of limits to growth. When DDT was introduced for civilian use, King wrote, within two years, Guyana had almost eliminated malaria. But at the same time, the birth rate had doubled. So my chief quarrel with DDT in hindsight, he says, is that it has added greatly to the population problem. Not enough people dying. Population bomb author Paul Ehrlich likewise blamed DDT for the drastic lowering of death rates in underdeveloped countries. He suggested that because those countries were not practicing a birth rate solution, they needed to have a death rate solution imposed on them, ban DDT. 
global warming, sustainability, and attacks on fossil fuels and biotechnology, like gold and rice, must therefore also be understood as other components of their death rate solution and their intense desire to control human endeavors and futures. President Obama's chief science advisor, John Holdren, put it this way in his book in 1978. A massive campaign must be launched to de-develop the United States and bring our economic system into line with the realities of ecology and the global resource situation. Once the United States has clearly started on the path of cleaning up its own mess, it can then turn its attention to the problems of de-development of the other developing, developed countries and the ecologically feasible development of underdeveloped countries. So limits to growth, the global resource situation, and ecologically feasible development, of course, are synonyms for resource depletion, peak oil, sustainable development, and other terminology, with radical deep green ecologists in and out of government making all the decisions for all of us. Never mind that fracking has obliterated their peak oil and gas mantra. Never mind that human ingenuity and innovation, Julian Simon's ultimate resource, have always and will always find new ways to find and extract the energy and minerals needed to make new technology that will continue improving lives, living standards, and planetary health. For eco-imperialists, whatever they support is sustainable. Whatever they disdain is unsustainable. Whatever Whatever they advocate complies with the precautionary principle. Whatever they hate violates the principle. The precautionary principle also always focuses on the alleged risks of using a technology, but never on the risks of not using it. It spotlights risks that a technology, such as coal-fired power plants, might cause, but it ignores the risks that the technology would reduce or prevent. And that's the reason why major reason why over 700 million Africans and 300 million Indians, three times the population of the United States and Canada combined, still have no access to electricity or only sporadic access. Worldwide, almost two and a half billion people, nearly a third of the world's population, still lack electricity or must rely on little solar panels or completely unreliable networks and grids. That means they must burn food, wood and dung for heating and cooking, which results in widespread lung diseases that kill two to four million people every year. It also means they lack refrigeration, safe water, and decent hospitals, causing virulent intestinal diseases that kill another two million people a year. But when these cold realities are pointed out, the Terminator 2 deep ecology androids morph yet again shifting the topic to global cataclysms of man-made climate change and sustainable, unsustainable development. To the extent that they do want to improve pe these people's lives, they advocate wind turbines in villages and solar panels on huts, but never affordable, reliable electricity from large-scale coal, natural gas, hydroelectric, or nuclear facilities. Simply put, Big Green's Big Green is immorally and callously indifferent to human suffering. Big Green movement activists also rail about global species extinction, but these claims are based on completely irrelevant examples of predators introduced into island populations. They also ignore the true threats to wild plants and animal species, the very technologies that the Green activists advocate the most fervently, biofuels and wind technologies. These eco-friendly technologies, supposedly, blanket vast areas that would otherwise be wildlife habitats, and wind turbines slaughter millions of birds and bats annually, nearly wiping out species in areas around the turbine facilities. The key point, then, to remember is this. Climate change, sustainability, and these other mantras give Mr. Holdren and his ideological soulmates the justification and power to determine the fate of nations, to decide how much development each should be allowed to have, to compel rich countries to de-develop and reduce their living standards, and to force poor countries to accept whatever the deep ecologists decide is the proper, sustainable, climate stabilization level of development, poverty, disease, malnutrition, and premature death. On and on it goes. 
with social and climate justice, yet another weapon that wealthy, powerful, arrogant, intolerant, immoral, and mostly white elites are using in their quest to control the rest of humanity. Their double standards, secret science, morphing mantras, and vicious attacks on anyone who dares to disagree with them all are designed to seize power over the energy that powers modern civilization and to control every aspect of our lives, livelihoods, living standards, fundamental liberties, health, welfare, dreams, and aspirations. These mantras truly are weapons of mass destruction in a movement war on modern civilization. It is a war that pits wealthy elites against poor minority and working classes in, developing, in developed countries and rich nations against poor nations. And in those poor nations, it is a war on women and children, for they are the most vulnerable, and they die in the greatest numbers from malaria, lung infections, and intestinal diseases. Equally revealing and frightening is the fact that this big green, big government movement refuses, refuses to budge an inch, even when they're confronted with what's going on in the world, the turmoil and destruction we're witnessing in Ukraine, the Middle East, Nigeria, and other parts of the world, many of them energy rich and with the prospect of Al-Qaeda controlling countless billions of dollars in oil wealth. The movement's focus on distant, conjectural, fabricated risks a century from now remains unchanged, making this truly the greatest moral and ethical battle of our time. And that's what we're up against. We've struck a blow here at this conference for honest, evidence-based science, for transparency and open, robust debate, for the freedom and courage to stand up to the forces of tyranny, darkness, and death. But our work is not yet finished. Like the Thirty Years' War and other religious and ideological confrontations over the ages, this battle will go on and its global death toll will rise before it subsides. However, I am truly heartened by the knowledge that we here gathered today will fight on for honest science, affordable energy, and better lives for billions of people, and against the dark forces of climate fanaticism. I also know we're being joined by more and more countries as they increasingly understand what is really going on. In the immortal words of Sir Winston Churchill, we shall fight in the fields, in the streets, and in the hills we shall never surrender. We shall fight on until victory, however long and hard the road may be, for without victory there is no survival. Thank you.